Hi everyone, I'm Melissa Thalen, Account Executive at ProMap. Thanks for joining the webinar today with Mark Woodward and Matt Pensick. Mark and Matt are both Directors of Strategy and Transformation at Morgan Franklin. Mark delivers financial management and performance improvement solutions to clients, ranging from strategy development to implementation of initiatives to drive growth and efficiency, improve performance, and manage change. He has over 25 years of experience in providing management guidance to C-level executives in operations, strategy, process improvement, and FP&A. Matt advises private equity firms and companies in strategic finance, financial planning, and capital allocation, and business transformation. He has significant experience in developing and implementing strategic initiatives that drive value creation, and has served as a key executive advisor for companies ranging from startups to multinational corporate corporations. Before we begin, I'll just quickly go through a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session will be about 45 minutes, plus Q&A at the end. Your lines have all been muted to avoid background noise, but there will be time at the end of the presentation for any questions you may have. If you'd like a question um, or to communicate with me, you can do so at any time in the question section of the GoToWebinar panel. That's in the top right corner of your screen. And we'll answer your questions at the end of the session. We're also recording today's webinar. A link to the recording will be emailed to you this week, which you're welcome to share. It's now my pleasure to hand it over to Mark and Matt. Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and to those of you in other areas of the country, good morning. And uh, overseas, if you're in New Zealand, like one of our colleagues from ProMap, it's four in the morning. So we know that there's a lot of different uh, areas represented. And Matt and I are very excited to be here today to share with you our experience as well as our understanding of finance transformation. Um, it's really important to, to define what this is. What we are providing you is just the tip of the iceberg on finance transformation. It's an overview, but what we are share, gonna share are the main things that we find helpful to, to start to get a grasp for how broad and how deep finance transformation really is. So I think one thing that is, uh, well, I'll walk you through the agenda today. Uh, we'll give you a brief introduction to Morgan Franklin to introduce ourselves. Um, and then we'll talk about the de definition of finance transformation, the end-to-end -end definition. And we'll follow that <clears throat> by a discussion of when that typically happens. When do we see finance transformation happening? Finance transformation itself is a big word. You may, it might be intimidating. But the thing is you want to understand and recognize when you start to see that happening or the need for it happening in your organization. Um, so we'll talk about the common drivers. Then we'll talk about the four enablers that uh, make change happen in an organization when they're, uh, they're uh, initiated properly. Um, we'll follow that then with some examples of success because the whole point of this is to make improvements in an organization. So we want to give you some examples of how the, the before, how we approach the problem and how we saw and the, and the solution and the impact. Uh, so once you've seen that, kind of end-to-end, -end, what finance transformation is, we want to uh, talk about how do you assess where to start in your organization. You may see 10 different things, uh, but we, we want to walk you through how you go about doing that. And then finally, we want to leave you with some of our, uh, our experience in terms of what makes finance transformation successful uh, and leave you with that, uh, that information. So I'll start off here with about Morgan Franklin. Um, <clears throat> one thing, uh, Morgan Franklin is a, a management and technical advisory uh, consulting firm. And we serve both businesses and government entities, organizations of all sizes. We have um, very experienced practitioners and we typically jump in and hit the ground running and in the end, our goal and our experience has been that we need companies and customers in a better situation than when we started. Um, I also want to give you a little background <clears throat> on myself. We have people in our organization who are big four, very experienced big four pe people. I have been with Morgan Franklin seven years, but I spent a lot of time in industry, in corporate finance, in a lot of different areas in corporate finance. So what I've 
I bring in the way that I provide help and advice and service to my clients is my experience as a practitioner in, in corporate finance. Now we'll talk about the end-to-end -end definition. Now, as I said, finance transformation is a very broad topic. Um, but essentially what it is is a set of solutions or activities that, that help finance leaders and finance teams identify, prioritize, and execute improvement initiatives. Now, if you were to look at all the different capability areas, everything that finance does, one big word for that is taxonomy, classifications of activities and, and capabilities that finance delivers. Um, there's about 30 of them, very well defined. And your organization may have parts of those uh, that are very mature and parts of them that are immature. But how do you get a hold of this? It's, it can be very complex because there's so many things covered. It's everything that finance does. And what is helpful to us is to think about it in terms of the nature of what the benefit to the organization is that, that to, to classify certain types of capabilities. And the first most common area actually is, is areas to make the organization and the company more efficient. Uh, the second is how finance informs the rest of the organization. And so those are informing capabilities. And the third area is the strategic capabilities. Is, is finance aligned to the rest of the organization, to the goals of the organization? What is the operating model? So those three things is a framework to help think about all the different types of capabilities that finance brings to the organization. The, the last and the banner at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that we're touching right now on those enablers, how you actually make change happen right. And it's really important, and I can't emphasize this too much, is that the right approach to finance transformation ensures that the people, processes, data, and technology are aligned in the right way. And this is where success comes from. So now we'll move on to the first category of efficient. And efficient actually covers anything that really has to do with process. This is the, the big process area, and it's about shortening cycles, improving accuracy. And one way that finance can improve is to impl implement process improvements. And I know a lot of you are PROMAT practitioners, so this is dear to your heart. I mean, this is where you live. And the, the, the three big process areas that are most commonly uh, you, where you see problems and improvement opportunities is in record to record, order to cash, and procure to pay. And I think it's helpful to unpack this is what we've done is we said, what are the, the challenges that you can often experience as well as the targeted opportunities? Now you may say, why don't we just put on a challenge that it's a 30-day close? Well, if you're a public company, that would be a significant problem. But what we want to do here is go back to, to more the kind of the flags that are the symptoms or the causes of a delay in the closed process. So there's manual operations, duplicate processes, people doing rework. Uh, potentially you have data validations that take up a lot of time during a closed process, for instance, um, or data quality errors. And the opportunities kind of mirror those pain points and challenges. So there's all sorts of things in the record to report area, closed process, chart of accounts redesign, um, when you start looking at your data model, um, consolidation, automation, uh, and then also order to cash, procure to pay. Now, one thing I also want to emphasize is that those of you who are deep in process understand that while this is a broad topic, there's a lot of different areas. In addition to the record to report, order to cash, and procure to pay, you also have fixed assets, treasury, and, and other capabilities that finance has to deliver that's process focused. But um, we, uh, each of these processes is very deep, very complex. If you unwind um, the order to cash process, there's multiple handoffs within an organization. There's, uh, there's different technology interfaces that you deal with. There's data handoffs between the technologies. Um, 
and then there's a lot of people involved in different areas. And so you have to address all those different things to make sure that you're addressing that process right. So you kind of got to unpack that process and use a very disciplined approach to do that. Um, and then how you address it is you identify root causes of inefficiencies to make improvements. We'll go on to informing. Informing is primarily the area of the business that is managed by FTNA. It's delivering information to the organization to improve speed to insight and to enable better decision making. Um, common challenges there are ad hoc reporting and many are duplicative Excel reports. And not, not, it's not just the use of Excel, because Excel can be very helpful, uh, particularly in smaller organizations. But it's when it's used to, to do everything, it can become a problem because of version control and, and, uh, and if it's manual, manual process, data uh, manipulation, ETL practices that are not automated, where you're downloading information and then sending it up to another process. Uh, so you could have things that affect FPNA are a lack of central data sources, um, conflicting data definitions. Uh, it, there could be limited forecasting. So you may have your, your financial reporting taken care of, but do you have a vision of, of the ability to see uh, into the future? Do you have the ability to kind of map that out? And provide planning and forecasting to the organization. Um, and Mark, Mark, I think, yeah, yeah if, I, if I was to say, if we kind of look across our client base and where, and even in the, as, as you all as finance professionals, you feel this, this burn when your executive team or your leadership team, or even your operations team, is saying things like, we don't have the information to make decisions about the business, or feel like the finance department is starving the business because we don't have those insights driven off of the data uh, that are done on a timely basis. Um, and so this is extremely common uh, that this is kind of the breaking point uh, that we see you know, many times at, at the beginning of our engagements. Yeah, and because you, the financial reporting, you have to do that. You have requirements to do that. Management reporting is more subjective, and so the, the, a big problem on management reporting is do you have the level of granularity you need for the business? So that's where the data model becomes very, very important to an organization. So understanding information needs is where improvement opportunities come in FPNA. The next area that we like to think about is more strategic area, area that is primarily focused on is finance being the right kind of partner that the organization needs. And it's about alignment. It's alignment to the rest of the organization. Do you know your business partner? It's alignment to organizational goals. It's looking at the finance organization itself, the human capital side of it, to look at how the structure of finance, how you deliver the service, uh, as well as the talent that you have are the right people in the right places. So this often becomes a significant issue when you have a merger or an acquisition, some big event takes place uh, or an, a, a divestiture can cause this where you have a carve out. You've got to right, resize certain areas and, and, and start to modify things. And you need to think things about things more strategically. Um, and some of the opportunities uh, are improving that alignment, uh, leveraging technologies in an innovative ways. Uh, so robotic process automation, machine learning to use uh, to improve your processes. So there's a lot of opportunities, but, but you'll see that when you get into this situation, you need to make, um, take a little bit more time to unpack and create a vision for how you're going to modify the way finance operates. Now we're going to talk about the drivers of finance transformation. In our experience, when the way we see this happening, and we were talking about some big events, typically um, maybe about half of what we see in terms of finance transformation is takes the form of triage, and it's the emergency room. And something, either a big event has happened, um, there's either a transaction or a new ERP system, or you have 
your business outpaced the ERP system or the system that you have. You might have homegrown systems or smaller that that that, that aren't to don't scale with the business. So when this happens, <clears throat> you have to fix it. It's broken, and you got to fix it. And typically, there's three kind of activities that we see in triage that are taking place. Uh, there's you need to have interim resources come in to meet the day-to-day -day challenges. Um, there is you, you need to manage the basic finance processes. You've got to get the books closed. You've got to get the cash in, and you've got to pay the bills to keep the lights on. You know, and so there's <clears throat> those baseline activities have to get delivered. And then lastly is if you have transition where key employees leave, uh, we see the, the need for knowledge capture and transfer is another important piece of this. The next area that's most common, <clears throat> say roughly 30%, of the kind of activity is more in optimization. And it goes back to the key process areas of, of um, order to cash, procure to pay, uh, and as well as the FP&A processes, the cycle times on forecasting. You, you know these are areas that need to be improved, and it's very obvious to you. The third area, which I roughly say is 20%, where we see the need for some preventative action. And most commonly this happens when you have a new leader come into an organization. And before you start to change things, you've got to have a vision. So it's, it's really important to then <clears throat> take a little more thoughtful approach and start to assess where the entire organization is, how you're aligned to your partners, um, and where you need to actually start to take action. So now I'm going to uh, hand this over to Matt, who's going to talk about the four enablers of change. Thanks, Mark. And so, everyone, I, you know, when it comes to finance transformation, I think uh, we talk in, in it, it, it's, it's a big topic, and many times it's hard to boil it down into either where to start or what the drivers are. But what we've seen in kind of our experience with some of the, our, our finance transformation engagements Clients are reaching out and saying, hey, we cannot produce the next type of information we need for the business, or our close is taking us three times as long as it should. Uh, it really boils down to four main areas and what we call enablers. And these enablers are people, process, data, and technology. Uh, and finance transformation has to include all of these. If you miss one of them, it's you're subject to a finance transformation failure. And um, what this really means, when we talk about, let's break, let's unpack these a little bit. So on the people side, as change is happening in an organization, as um, the, the finance organization specifically can't produce the type of information it needs to feed and empower the business, uh, there is a lot of times a lack of clarity around who is doing what. What is the role of finance? What, what, does, what does finance provide to the business? And what, what, what should folks in the organization look to finance to do? Um, on the process side, this is, Mark, Mark touched on those kind of main processes that we see around transform, transforming you know, the end-to-end -end, uh, integration and, and optimization of those processes. Uh, but, in each of these, or each organization, it's different. And uh, depending on where you are on the maturity scale in these other areas, process can be, sometimes become overburdensome and um, can really get to aggravation of, of, of your folks and your finance organization around how things are broken uh, in those processes. Uh, and then data. Data is kind of the blood that goes through the veins of a company. Being able to uh, utilize data, manage data, and uh, harness its power uh, is a central role of what finance is and what finance transformation tries to do. Um, and then technology. Technology is an obvious answer to many problems in inside organizations, across the organization, not just in finance, but many times 
folks look at technology as a silver bullet, whereas all of these other areas need to be taken into consideration. So if we kind of look at, at what, what it means to optimize these four enablers, like I mentioned, if you have focused on one of these, two of these, three of these, and you're missing one of them, there's going to be friction. There's going to be some type of inefficiencies in the way that your finance transformation is occurring. So uh, typically, we find that organizations that look at technology as the central, the main thing that they need to focus on in some type of uh, project inside the finance group, they usually are, are lacking the focus in those other three areas. And you see it pop in the transformation timeline. Um, uh, same thing when you focus too much on process. Building a process without the adequate technology in terms of integrating systems together and basically supplementing it or making it or making up for the lack of, of maturity in these other areas through over-processing um, a, a overall end-to-end -end um, process in, the, in finance tend to add way too much complexity and tend to, to slow down a, a transformation. Um, and so through all of these enablers, what we recommend is that every project plan that, that, uh, of a finance transformation needs to consider each one of these. Uh, if not, uh, there will be added complexity and added friction uh, along the line. And, and you might not get the benefits that you, you might thought you would have through a finance transformation. Um, so that dives us right into kind of our recommendations around these enablers. First, like I mentioned, don't just make it all about technology. When you're thinking that, oh, okay, well, I need to put together an ETM tool, and I'm going to implement it, and we're going to go live and five weeks on it, and this is going to solve all of our problems. Challenge the organization. Challenge the, or, the, the leadership to think about it from in the lens of the other three enablers as well. And who's going to be performing this? Right? The people are the, are the catalyst around, the, around transformation. And so getting buy-in and understanding where, where the finance organization and who in the finance organization is leading that change is extremely important. Two is around requirements. Too often, we see that our companies, or our, our clients, jump straight into a transformation without really thinking about what is the need of transforming a certain process or, or, or uh, some type of function inside the finance organization. Building and focusing on those core requirements up front will alleviate so much trouble as you go through that it, it basically guides your finance transformation so that you're making sure at the end of, the, uh, end of that transformation, your, your requirements are all met. Um, and then third, this is becoming extremely more and more important by the day, by the hour, is around data management. Quality data and ensuring from start to finish, from the time data enters your organization through the time it goes out on an external report or, or end user of that data, that there are qual data quality checks in place that integrity is not sacrificed. Uh, too often, we are engaged by either private equity firm, a board of directors, or uh, executive teams that come to us that say, you know, we have a management reporting package, but we get it, and there's always errors in it. Or I can't really rely on the stuff that I'm seeing to make decisions about the business. This gets to core of data management and having a distinct focus on it. Um, so, like we've kind of mentioned throughout the, 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 the uh, webinar here is that we see this stuff play out on a day-to-day -day basis with our clients. And maybe what we do here is talk through a couple of the cases that we see that really exemplify what finance transformation is on a tactical, real-life basis. And, um, 
talk about a little bit about the, the drivers of what we saw. So this first example was a, a private equity-owned uh, portfolio company. It was, it was doing about $60 million in, in revenue a year, and we were approached because they could not produce reliable financial data on a timely basis. Not even so on a re management reporting and an internal reporting standpoint, but even to their external shareholders. And in the private equity space, when you have problems doing bank reporting, your creditors are gonna are gonna be like hawks on you. Um, so we kind of our approach to this was okay. Let's assess what's going on. Let's take a deep dive into the processes that are really holding up the close process. And what we found was that it was really reliant on when revenue was being flowed. So we, we, we took a real deep dive into the revenue, first the revenue generation report, the order to cash process, and said, what, what is it in the process execution of that that's holding things up? But then where does that intersect with the record to report? And we were able to identify some extreme inefficiencies and let, and take that, that that lens of people, process, data, and technology, apply it against that, that, um, that what we were seeing in terms of the inefficiencies, and apply a standard approach to their close. They didn't have a closed checklist. They didn't have a closed calendar. They were, it was, there was lack of clarity about who was doing what at, on a monthly basis. That approach supported by all of our enablers allowed us to kind of eliminate all of the inefficiencies in that their close process um, actually produced enough time for them to get caught up on some of the account reconciliations that they failed to do in the prior months. And um, really, it all started with a, a, a leadership there that was um, supportive of the change and to really look at things in a different light. And, and the end here was that we were able to have a 66% 66, 66 improvement uh, in their close process, which if you think about it, that's a drastic change to the stakeholders and, the, and, and who needs that data and, and the, the time at which they're able to now receive that and make decisions off of it uh, that wasn't there to begin with. And Matt, I just wanted to bring out one thing that's illustrated in this example <clears throat> that I've seen a number of times with different clients, and that is where you have the closed process is taking time <clears throat> because it's intertwined with other processes. So here you have the order to cash and the closed process, kind of one process, but really they're separate. And there's different timelines and deadlines for a closed process, and I've seen it where they there's other things that are other activities that are going on. You don't have the, the right accruals aren't being done properly. Um, so this is this is something to think about. You know, just making sure that you're able to pull those apart. Exactly, and, that, and that's a that's a great point, Mark. And that that dovetails right into kind of our next case study here around the order to cash process and all of the complexities inside that process, but what improvement of that allows from a reporting standpoint and where you can see tangible benefits of a finance transformation project. So this next case study, we were engaged because this, this is a, it was a humongous company in terms of uh, not only what they did, but over the, their, their scale. Uh, they were about $3 billion in, in revenue. Um, they had a ton of regulatory and um, compliance driven reporting requirements and um, really it was a complex business just at the core of what they did. Um, that coupled with the fact that there was really no standard in the way that they did any type of contracting um, or uh, how, how uh, folks interacted with the client all the way through into um, how to collect data about it and, and, and specifically financial data. Uh, and, and what this did is it, 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 when it made it all the way down to the finance folks that, and the accounting folks that were looking to generate invoices, they were generating things, invoices of things that were way, way old. And 
from any, anybody that's been in a position of cash flow management realizes this is this is a problem. Um, so again, we took a root cause approach and said, all right, well, what is the genesis of, of this complexity in their process? Oh, okay, they've got six different departments that all have different layers to them, and, and there's no, uh, it's all manual, and there's no collaboration across departments. Uh, at the same time, people were confused about what their role was in the process, uh, and again, what different departments did in their understanding. Um, and then there were the, this. This was this is an area again. When we talked about data management; it's so important. There was no governance around the definition of certain terms and data elements, um, and it it really cause a bunch of rework because people were referring to the same term in different, or the same element with, by different terms and then different definitions for the same term. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, everything was manual. It was, and so they were taking extracts out of systems, passing it over, kind of, kind of massaging the data, transforming it, and then uploading it into another system and doing that all on the line. And as you can, as you quite can imagine, there's a lot of data loss and and, and questions around integrity of the data. Um, so what we did is we said, all right, well, we're going to take again that four enabler pro, four enabler view on things, and let's go start to finish through this order cash to cash process. Start with the requirements. Again, we we talked earlier about how those requirements drive everything during the transformation process. The business requirements document really then uh, guided what the initiatives that we were going going under and looking at it from the lens, think about the initiative of a business requirement and at the lens of people, process, technology, and data. And we were able to apply improvements in each of those enablers to, to meet those business requirements and this was an example of a, a, a transformation folks that produced tangible cash flow improvements by 20 million bucks. That's when you can show your stakeholders that investing in finance transformation pays dividends. It pay, it, it, it's a net positive investment. Um, and so this, this one really excited us, and, and this is kind of our our poster child of taking a large complex process at a large complex organization and translating it into positive return for our clients. So if we kind of look through those case studies and say, oh, okay, well, where do we start? Where do we, you know, my, maybe you're thinking to yourself, my organization is, you know, so far behind in this area. Maybe we're really good at budgeting and and forecasting, but our closed process is terrible. Or, you know, our organization struggles with operations just dumping information or data on us uh, as a finance or and us having to kind of pick up the pieces and try to put it into some some mold for them to, to get, get uh, benefit out of. Um, what we try to, tip, to do here is to put you kind of on a maturity model based off of the functional areas that you see kind of the left of your screen and what we believe is kind of important areas in the in the finance board. Um, and start by looking at where are you on this scale? And at times it's hard in an organization to understand what if you're doing is leading practice, if it's top of the line, or if you guys feel like you're in 1980, and the rest of organizations are in 2050. Um, so we try to break that down, and, and and like Mark mentioned earlier about how it, it usually begins. When we get calls, we can kind of kind of kind of gauge of where they are in terms of the triage versus um, optimization and physical therapy versus uh, preventative health care, preventative and, and optimizing and aligning strategy. 
Uh, and we'd say that if we, if we look at where we get calls, most of them will be in that triage department. And those are where uh, where we see companies fitting into the typical column, uh, and sometimes even to the left, uh, where they're, they're kind of losing practice. Um, our approach is to take things from a step-by-step -step through, our, through our enablers and um, take you from typical losing practices into typical, into advancing and up to leading. And what that, what that means is tactically translating those business requirements into these, these functional areas, but not trying to boil the ocean here and not trying to become a leading finance organization if you know that your, your close process is 45 days long. Um, and having this insight of where other companies are versus where, where you are in your finance organization uh, is something that we kind of provide our clients so that they can feel a comfort knowing here's where we are, here's where we need to get to, and then let's take a look at the business requirements and strategic initiatives to get there. Um, and, and, and that is, I wanted to share, Matt, real quick, that this is a, this is a tool. <clears throat> it's, I mean, if you are in a triage situation, you, you know what you have to do. However, if we're there doing triage, this is what's in the back of our mind. We're looking at the whole opportunity, and this is how, how we encourage finance leaders to think. It's like you may be solving a problem, but take a look at everything else that's going on and have a grid for, <clears throat> you don't need everything to be in the leading area. Over time, you will shift to that area, but the, the point is, you, you for any capability, you wanna find out those critical areas where there's a big gap between where you're functioning right now and where the business really needs you to be. And so it may be really obvious, like in triage, but, have this, this is just a tool we want to illustrate to, to, to and, and these are, you, you can go into a lot of detail on these, these maturity models, particularly if you're doing the strategy work. You really need to, this is where you need to vision, where are you today, where do you need to be? That's a great point, a great point. The, the strategy that, when, I, when we think about that strat, strategic point, part of an effective finance organization, it's the leading companies and leading finance organizations that are translating the finance organization into the strategy of the company. And you typically see that because you'll see the CFO role playing very close to the CEO role in how finance can empower the, the overall organizational strategy. And that's becoming more and more of a of a leading practice, and what we see as the future of finance um, being as a, as the CFO CFO role becomes more and more a core part of the way that the business strategizes and operates. And because of finance's role, finance if you do that, if you embrace this as an organization, finance can drive improvements throughout the organization and become the leaders and become that, having that strategic seat at the table rather than just delivering the results and and, uh, and not as much more of a reporting uh, function. But that there's opportunity here, definitely. I think, and, and Mark, I tell you, if, I bet you folks on the webinar today probably, there's probably some of the folks that are on that feel like that that are in a finance organization that maybe is seen more so as an execution type and, and support organization than one that empowers the organization. And through finance transformation, you can transfer from being kind of a service-oriented enabler to empowering the organization going forward. Um, that's a really cool thing to see. It's a really cool thing to be a part of. And that's why we think that people are such a big part of the approach in finance organization in finance transformation. Now, what we again, you kind of saw this this more so on and in getting into our approach of how we go through finance transformation uh, engagements and how we advise our clients to do it if they're doing it themselves. 
are, you know, you've kind of seen this assess, design, build, deploy. Um, what's important to note here is that that assess and really the design phase and that first bullet point around business requirements is extremely important. If you don't have buy-in from everybody in the organization and it isn't clear about what this project is doing and how it's how we're going to get there and what you're going to get out of it, not from just a finance function perspective, but also outside to all of your stakeholders, that uh, don't don't even bother going forward with the, the, the transformation if that's if that's not abundantly clear. Um, the, the other thing to note with this approach is that this is an iterative process, right? As, as we've seen with so many of the processes in for, inside an organization, whether it be software development or user experience or frontward facing, customer facing um, uh, processes and functions inside the organization, taking an iterative and agile approach to finance transformation helps to show quick results um, from this initiative uh, to your stakeholders to get additional buy-in. So like we said, don't try to jump from losing organization and losing practices all the way to leading practices within one finance transformation project. It's, hey, we can't we can't produce a management reporting package within 40 days of month end month end. Tackle that one, right? Show your management team, show your executive team, show your board that you can do that, and then take on the next project. Um, and this, operating at, in quick sprints and quick turnarounds through this approach allows you to, to then uh, build and build and build and take on larger transformations that will then get you from kind of losing to typical to uh, growing to 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 lead. Um, so overall, that's kind of what we see is as a great approach, taking it iteratively. And then, you know, what are the what are the things that we see as are, are are those factors that you need to take into consideration for success? Um, is is really around um, around a like we said, the enablers of people, process, technology, and data, having that, having your leadership team bought in and true resources put behind it. It's one thing to say, hey, we want to improve our closed process. Or, oh, we got to get, get to a point where finance is giving the data to operations to make decisions about the business on a more timely basis. But it's another thing to actually put dollars and people and resources behind it, and this comes from a leadership a, a, a leadership vision that is geared towards um, change and geared towards improvement. Um, and and another key thing I maybe hi highlight real quick here on is around that repeatable approach. Like we mentioned, it's an iterative process. Don't think about a finance transformation as, okay, we're going to do this and, and it will be done in six months and boom, the organization will be happy. No. It needs to be something that there are, is a culture, processes, and buy-in. That is, this is part of, part. this is ingrained in who we are as a finance organization. And really, that helps to serve as an example other functional areas in the organization. So finance leading the charge in terms of transforming and improving its, its, its functional um, capabilities serves as a kind of a, a beacon of light that's for the rest of the organization to say, well, finance is able to improve on a continuous basis. How do we translate this over to HR? How do we translate this over to IT? Anything to add there, Mark? Yeah, um, I think change management is really critical, and you'll see on the next slide, uh, really success depends upon the people, because and we, we can tell you about train wrecks, where we're, we're, we're going to implement a new billing system because we have problems with day sales outstanding. Well, 
I, I was at a company where we had three billing systems implemented, and they were all failures because finance never signed off on the requirements, but IT, by gosh, by golly, was going to implement this system. And it was very, very difficult um, <laughs> operating in that environment. So you, you have to have, you know, you have to have a plan. And instead of just telling you about the train wrecks, uh, what went wrong, it's really important that leadership is there at the from the start, that that you have executive sponsorship of any kind of initiative. The second is to have active change management that leadership is part of, communicating with the people, setting the vision, saying this is where we're going, we're going to go here, and then being consistent in that message. Then what you need to do is set realistic targets. Um, and we on, on the prior slide where we where we talk about this repeatable process, a very disciplined execution approach is there's always a roadmap. You have a roadmap that is going to continue to change, but start with a reasonable, maybe three projects that you're going to work on, the most critical ones, and then you you say where you identify the baseline, where you are today, where you it's on close, we're at 20 days, and we want to get down to 15. Set realistic goals in re, during, during realistic timelines then set your goal and then figure out how you're going to measure it. It's all about measuring. You don't have to do, you know, a, a ton of work to figure some of this stuff out. Um, but you have to have a plan to measure. And um, the other thing is, and then you have to be accountable to that, to your blueprint. The other thing is, it just doesn't, this doesn't happen by itself. You need to have, whether you call it, it or call it a program management office or not, you need to have people who are dedicated to this, and and you can't just. Sometimes it's very difficult for organizations to do this on their own, um, to manage their regular jobs and to do the transformation as well, and to manage it and drive it, because it's not just going to happen. Um, so, and, and 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 again, once you've set your targets, you really have to define those measures of success and and keep accountable for that. So I was going to pass that on, but then, and and this is. <laughs> This is not a white paper. I just want to make sure. I don't know if I said that before. This is a this is a conversation from from a, with us, and this is just the tip of the iceberg on finance transformation. Uh, we have a lead behind. I understand that you'll be able to get a copy of this, so you can take a look for yourself, spend a little more time, and have this as a reference. Um, but this is really a framework for an initial conversation. So we're, we're and this is probably the most important thing that I would like to get across that we want to share with you is that it's about the people and that you have to tie into the passion of your teams. If you don't, if they don't have buy-in, you're not going to be successful. They have to see success too. So you have to think about, okay, I need to set realistic goals so that we can actually have success. And because success begets success. And, and so any, you have to tie into the emotional and the behavioral uh, kind of a place where your folks are, and to get them motivated to participate in this. And some of the key people that typically really embrace this kind of change, understanding that change benefits everybody. And I put down here, message loud and clear that everyone actually benefits. It's not just the organization. It's not just the company and the bottom line. Because if you have efficient and timely processes, and you've been underwater for six months or years, your life is going to get better, and you're going to have opportunity to actually do other value-added activities. And again, it's about adding value, adding value to the shareholders, adding value to the employees. So tapping into your strongest asset, people, is, is what's most important. And that's where we find our most, our success, is that we connect with our clients and we get in there and we think, well, how, how would I feel? What do I, how do I help these folks get into a better place and provide that support? I don't know, Matt, if you had anything else you wanted to share on that. No, I think you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a, a catalyst for change of people. And, and the more you have those built, bought in, the better, better things are going to go. And, and while, while looking at those enablers, um, people are, is usually the, the one that, that uh, sparks the need for, um, for focus in this area. Yeah. Now, the last slide we're leaving you with is a summary. Um, just 
this simple construct of efficient, informing, strategic, how does, how does finance add value to the rest of the organization? And it's through these, these is kind of a summary of all the, the kind of the key components, key uh, capability areas that finance delivers to the rest of the organization. So um, now I think I might have gone over a little bit, but I'm going to hand this off to Melissa. And uh, we look forward any time to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much, Mark and Matt. We love your people and process centric approach to finance transformation. It's very much in line with how ProMap uh, enables our customers to tackle these transformations, really providing visibility into the end-to-end -end process and helping to be that bridge between people and process and change. So um, we've had a couple questions come in during the presentation, so I'll start with those. If you have a question you'd like to ask, you can go ahead and just type it in now. Um, we don't have much time left, but we'll see how many we can cover off in the time. Question number one is, how do your customers measure success? Um, I'll take this, Matt. Um, uh, I talked about it before. It's about, you have to identify what you can measure, first of all. <clears throat> and so, you, you have to measure your baseline and you kind of set a goal for where you want to be. And then you have to start to be accountable for that and have a time timeline for where you need to get that get to that goal. Um, and the different measurements that you could use, for instance, um, would be cycle times. We've talked a lot about um, close process, but order the cash. All, Anything you have has a cycle time. Is your forecasting cycle, how often do you forecast? How often does your business need it? Um, uh, measures of accuracy, error rates, say on journal entries, uh, do, do, you, do you track it? You, you need to start tracking it if you don't. If you think it's a problem area, you need to get some data on it. Um, you need to document, for instance, data quality, document it where you are today. It's all about finding out what your baseline is. Um, and there's a lot of metrics, but you don't necessarily need to do a full benchmarking effort to do this <laughs> right. And some of it could be obvious. However, I mean, benchmarking does come in and very helpful, um, and particularly to larger organizations. Um, strategy firms do benchmarking all the time, but um, we do it only when it's needed, and we try to find what are those key measures um, and then basically in each area you need to set those goals and, and achieve them. Great. Next question is with regard to the enablers. Where do you see the most change needed? I can take that one. Um, when we, in times, I think, mean, there are a lot of times that we get called into a finance transformation that has gone awry and something is wrong. And most of the time, they've, they've pretty much chosen pretty good technology. Um, and they've gone to implement it, uh, but they had no, um, no foresight into how that technology was going to change the way that they actually process data post implementation. And so it's the, the change management around process and, and, and people uh, really starts to fall in those type of situations. Um, and so again, it's it's process and, and it's people where I would say it's those are the to me and, and a lot of the the engagements that I've done, those are those are hard to, to do because the process a lot of times in implementing a new technology, whether it be automation of a, of a thing that you know a few folks did manually before, they wonder about who they are, what role they're going to play post post implementation, and then you know what does that mean for their process? Are they now less execution oriented and more analysis driven? Um, so people in process. That actually okay, great. And something else is important, um, and that is that. Whenever you're doing transformation, it, the organization, people might be thinking, well, we're just automating so that we're going to get rid of jobs. But that's not really how well-run organizations operate. 
Um, because if, if you're trying to scale to grow particularly, then you're trying to get, you're trading, being, bringing value to the organization by creating more efficiency. Um, another example of where enables are get, go in disarray is where you've got new technology, but you don't want to change your process. And so you try to put like a, square, a round peg in a square hole where you're trying to get the technology to fit your old process. You really need to be embraced and be open to considering, well, what are the improvements I could make in my process? People don't like change. And so part of this is overcoming that that resistance to change, the fear of change, and getting people, that's why they have to have a vision. Um, getting the folks to embrace a different process that you don't need to categorize how a customer left 20 different times, 20 different ways, maybe 10, 10 categories <laughs> of, of why a customer has a problem are enough when you're thinking about operations or, or billing. Um, it's like, how do you, how do you go and, and, uh, and approach that? In a, in, a, in a better way is important. Thanks, Mark. Can you talk a little bit more about the PMO? A lot of companies cannot afford to commit to a dedicated PMO. I know it is important, but how do you advise companies that have some reservation about moving forward with finance transformation because of this commitment to a PMO and the time and resources needed? Hi, Mark. I think simply it, it's there's an aspect to this is that you may need to devote either internal or external resources of some form. It's an investment. Um, the idea is if, if you have a, a culture of continuous improvement and you've seen the benefits and you, you, you see the investment you have to make, because you've got to coordinate. It's about communication and coordination. There is, yes, data, there's tracking, there's measurements, but there needs to be engagement between leadership, the team, and the rest of the organization. Because something I want to make sure we bring out is that finance transformation isn't just finance functioning in a silo. It's, it's you've got to engage with everybody in the organization too. And, and often, say, say you're doing a, an acquisition. Uh, typically, finance is just part of a transformational effort and you need there's, there's other things that are going on with the business where you're, you're combining your sales teams and, and your technology, and so finance is part of that. So that's where the PMO activity needs to be um, somebody keeping tabs of where things are going, having a plan, are you on track? And it's, it's just a matter of, if, if, you do, if you do a closed process, think about it this way, if you don't have a closed checklist, you're dead in the water. And you don't even realize it, but it's, it's so much more efficient when you do have that closed process and that, that checklist. Yeah, I would say from a PMO perspective, you're saying, well, you know, we're not big. We're, we're, we've got, we're not as big as the, the, the complex organization you shared in the case study. You know, we can't afford to have a, one person that's dedicated as a PMO for all of this. That's okay. Um, what I would challenge you to look at with, with that situation is are the folks that are, that are in the organization today and the finance function today bought into improvement as part of their normal job, as part of their requirements? Is it something that, that, that is required of your, your folks all the way from your AT clerk all the way through up to your CFO? Is it is change in your job requirement and improvement in your change in your job requirement. And if that's not the case, then it should be. And that is where I think smaller organizations are able to succeed without a dedicated full-time person who is a finance transformation PMO. If you can bear that burden of change and improvement across the entire and it's ingrained in your culture and what what folks do every day. Yeah, and you don't need you don't need everybody in the organization functioning in that way. If they see when we make improvements in you know, in some kind of automation or, or efficiency, and then oh now I get to do this other task, this other job because I used to do the, all this manual reporting. Now I can go and actually do some analysis and, and engage with the rest of the business. 
I mean, it's the leaders of your future leaders that you want to tap into to to get them to start to lead these efforts. And maybe it isn't a full-time effort, but you don't need everybody in the organization doing it. That's kind of, it's very difficult to do that. Okay, well we are running out of time. Um, I really want to thank everyone for joining us and thank you Mark and Matt for taking the time to speak to us today and sharing all of your great insights. We really appreciate it. And that's uh, the webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.